Schönen guten Abend, herzlich willkommen beim ersten Vortrag äh, in diesem Jahr, Mittwochvortrag. Ähm, diejenigen, die mich vielleicht noch nicht kennen, mein Name ist Dominik Brabant. Ich bin hier seit Oktober stellvertretender Direktor im Institut. Auch äh, einen guten Abend an alle, die in Zoom sich dazugeschaltet haben. Wir haben heute etwas schwierige Wetterverhältnisse und ähm, auch durch den Streik schwierige Verhältnisse. Aber wir, ich danke allen, die äh, gekommen sind hier und äh, dass wir hier so eine schöne doch äh, Gruppe geworden sind, um den Vortrag von Itai Sapir, Professor Dr. Itai Sapir, zu lauschen. Äh, wir freuen uns, äh, lieber Itai, dass du hier bist. Du bist ja kein Unbekannter. Ähm, du warst äh, in diesem Jahr schon für einen Monat im Juli bei ganz anderen Wetterverhältnissen hier und hast äh, zu einem Thema geforscht, das du uns heute auch in deinem Vortrag vorstellen möchtest und da freuen wir uns drauf und auch auf die Diskussion. Seit 2012 ist Itai Sapir Professor für Kunstgeschichte mit einem Schwerpunkt auf Italien, 17. Jahrhundert vor allem, also spätes 16., 17. Jahrhundert, aktuell auch seit 2022 Direkteur du Departement an der Université du Québec in Montreal in Kanada. Die Publikationen, von denen ich gleich noch ein paar ganz kurz vorstellen möchte, sind vor allem dem 16. und 17. Jahrhundert in Europa gewidmet und haben immer wieder, und das wird sicher auch heute in dem Vortrag ein Thema sein, die Frage in den Mittelpunkt gerückt nach den Zusammenhängen zwischen Kunst, künstlerischen Inszenierungen, Malerei vor allem äh, und den Verhältnissen zu Philosophie, zu philosophischen Gedanken, zu den Wissenschaften, aber auch zu der Politik und darüber hinaus. Ähm, Aufenthalte haben ähm, Itai Sapir immer wieder nach Deutschland gebracht, zuletzt 2018 bis 2019 im Rahmen eines Humboldt Fellowships äh, für äh, erfahrene Forschende ähm, war er an der Freien Universität Berlin und in diesem Rahmen dann warst du auch hier äh, am ZI für einen Monat und hast geforscht. Das Projekt, um das es heute gehen wird, heißt Dying and Time, Painting the Instant of Death in Early Modern Europe und es ist unter anderem mit einem Research Grant von der Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council unterstützt. Ähm, der neueste Artikel, der in den nächsten Wochen erscheinen wird, äh, wird auch um dieses Thema kreisen, äh, hat den Titel The Instant of Death, Side of the Real, The Thanatological Realism of Caravaggio. Ähm, und ich denke, wir werden auch heute ein wenig über Caravaggio hören. Es wird in einem Band erscheinen, der den Titel Arts Realism in the Post-Truth Era, Edinburgh University Press wird er erscheinen ähm, äh, und dort zu lesen sein. Von 2015 bis 2018 war Itai Sapi Direkteur des Programms d'études supérieures an der äh, Université du Québec, von 2009 bis 2011 Postdoc Researcher am KHI Florenz und äh, es gibt noch natürlich viele weitere Stationen, die ich jetzt nicht alle nennen werde. Die Doktorarbeit von Itai Sapir ist veröffentlicht worden 2012 unter dem Titel Ténèbres sans les sons, Epistemologie et Esthétique de la Peinture Ténébriste Romaine. Es war eine Doktorarbeit, die im Co-Tutel-Verfahren unter der Betreuung von Mieke Bahl an der Amsterdam, also Amsterdam und Daniel Kohn, Paris, ähm, äh, geschrieben worden ist. Ähm, wenn Sie in dieses Buch hineinblättern, ähm, werden Sie sehen, es geht um die Tenebristen natürlich, es beginnt mit Tizian, es geht um Tintoretto, äh, dann aber vor allem um A Adam Elsheim und Caravaggio, aber immer auch wieder um die Verbindungen dieser Malerei zu äh, Gedanken Giordano Brunos, Montaignes, aber auch Shakespeare's und Cervantes, also im besten Sinne ein interdisziplinäres Denken und ein Denken, das sozusagen Malerei auch als eine Form von Philosophie begreift. Ähm, als ich die Publikationsliste durchgesehen habe, habe ich mich über die vielen tollen Titel gefreut, die äh, wirklich Lust machen zu lesen. Ich werde nur noch zwei, drei nennen. Es äh, wird ein Buch erscheinen, ein, der als äh, 
Co-Direkteur äh, mit herausgibt, mit Fabian Krämer 2023 oder ist es schon erschienen? Ist, ist noch in Produktion, hat den schönen Titel Coping with Copia Epistemological Access in Early Modern Art and Science, Amsterdam University Press und 2020 gemeinsam mit Alessandro Novo, Nova und Hanna Gründler, The Announcement, Annunciations and Beyond. Wenn man sich die Liste der vielen Artikel äh, und Aufsätze anschaut, die Itai Sapir geschrieben hat, ähm, wird man sehen, es geht immer wieder um die tenebristische Malerei, beispielsweise in einem Aufsatz von 2021, Baroque Science Experimental Art, Question Mark, äh, Giuseppe de Ribera and Other Neapolitan Skeptics. Oder ein letztes Beispiel, das ich Ihnen ähm, nennen möchte, ein Aufsatz von 2018. Auch hier sticht der Titel sofort ins Auge, weil man da äh, erstmal drauf kommen muss, obwohl es so naheliegend dann auch ist. Pain and Paint. Äh, Titian Ribera and the Flaying of Marcias. Erschienen in einem Buch äh, über das Thema Visualizing, Sensor, Suffering and Effective Pain in Early Modern Europe and the Spanish Americas. Der Vortrag, lieber Eta, wird auf, ähm, auf Englisch sein, aber du sprichst wunderbar Deutsch. Es können auch gerne dann über Zoom Fragen auf Englisch, auf Deutsch, äh, auf Französisch äh, gestellt werden. Und äh, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, Dominik, für diese freundliche Einführung. Und vielen Dank natürlich auch Iris und Ulrich für die Einladung. Ich bin sehr, äh, also es freut mich sehr, hier zu sein. And as Dominic said, I will speak in English, uh, but uh, discussion can be in any other, any other language you want to. <clears throat> the martyrdom of Saint Ursula is considered Caravaggio's very last work and thus the preamble to his own demise. In it, Ursula, the pious Christian refusing to marry the king of the Huns, is assassinated by the pagan monarch in front of her eyes. In Michelangelo Maurice's telling, the hagiographic narrative becomes an audacious study of the temporal paradoxes of death, where the painter not only stops and freezes the continuous flow of time, but also draws our attention to the ontological impossibility that is the present moment and to, and to the particular metaphysical complexity of the instant in which a living, sentient and conscious being is transformed into inanimate net matter. In an article to be published in the next few weeks, and Dominique already mentioned it, in the edited volume, Arts Realism in the Post-Truth Era, I claim that what is particularly original in Caravaggio's treatment here is the fact that he gives concrete form to, he incarnates in pigments, exactly that temporal conundrum. The artistic gesture by a painter often considered, albeit simplistically, the first veritable realist is analogous to that of current new realist philosophers who, as Marcus Gabriel explains in his introduction to the Neuralismus, do not identify the incontestable reality whose existence they admit and want to rehabilitate with the external world or with nature and remain cautious vis-a-vis -vis what they call absolutist approaches that characterized past realisms. Indeed, as I have suggested elsewhere, new realist terms such as negative realism and minimal realism are better suited to explain the art of Caravaggio and other 17th century so-called naturalists than the more usual concepts routinely applied to them. The painting does not commit, cannot in good faith commit to any statement on the external facts of the world, but it becomes in Caravaggio's hand an undeniable fact in itself. Somewhat like John Austin's famous speech acts, Caravaggio's artworks forcibly allot reality to what might or might not have it in the first place. Let us look more closely. Ursula has just been reached by the fatal arrow, curiously shot at a, blank point, at a point blank range in this stiflingly limited space. She seems to look at her fatal wound objectively as a curious external event. At the same time, Caravaggio clearly indicates by her absent expression and her ghastly and ghostly paleness that she is not fully alive anymore. The latter element, 
Ursula's un otherworldly white complexion is strangely enough echoed by the Caravaggio lookalike behind her. Uh, can you see the, yeah, here, this guy here. Um, this man is presumed to be a self-portrait, but is emphatically different from the healthy color of the other figures. Caravaggio here attains on the threshold of his own death, a thrilling pictorial statement on the impossibility of pinning down the moment of death, on the complex fabric of contradictions or tensions that make up this instant that in spite of all has to exist. Because if we are alive and then we are dead, the shift has to take place at some point in time. Ursula is fully aware of her demise at the very instant in which her self-awareness, indeed her awareness per se, is no more. In the martyrdom of Saint Ursula, Caravaggio proposes a double suspension, suspension of and in time, but also a suspension of judgment. The instant he tries to capture that absurd moment in which Ursula realizes she is dying, the very realization immediately becoming null and void by the fact of the person doing the realization being now lifeless, cannot really exist. And yet here it is, incarnated in front of our eyes. The artistic leap of faith encounter, encounters and counters the profound knowledge of the futility of any attempt to get hold of such an instant to really make this paradox present on the canvas for centuries to come. Eliminating anything else from the image, temporal hints at past and future, spatial coordinates of position and place, Caravaggio emphasizes the diminution of his object to the most minimal narrative unit, a shrinking which, as Saint Augustine taught us, has no reason to stop and is doomed to infinite regression all the way to naught if the infinity of the regression didn't make even that very naught, in fact, unattainable. And yet the painter opens up this infinitesimal instant, infinitesimal instant, dangerously on the verge of collapsing into nothingness, just like one might unexpectedly open a fan. What seemed to have no concrete extension suddenly becomes a spectacle full of shapes, shades, and textures, undeniably there for us to see, to behold, and metaphorically, or if we're really lucky, concretely, to hold. The question of the instant of death, defining it, pinpointing it, isolating it from the ongoing continuous flow of time seems particularly timely nowadays. Physicians announce a person's death and are careful to declare the exact temporal coordinates of that event. It is quite easy to explain why we are obsessed with such precision. Technological developments in medicine make it possible to artificially keep some vital functions going on in a person whose status as a living being is all but obvious. Conversely, transplantations raise the question of what a, when a human being whose some organs still function can be deemed legally dead and thus legitimately be deprived of these organs for the sake of saving another person's health or life. If the issue is indeed so important, and if we as art historians believe that the visual arts have always actively participated in their own, own visual way in social discussions and debates, just as they do in our own time, then the question of how past art made statements about the instant of death is rather crucial, or at least somewhat interesting. For our field, the question of the definition of death and its temporal assignation is entangled with the issue of the visibility of death of whether and how the coming of death can be seen and correlatively might be visually represented. Among the rare studies that tackle the issues that issue directly, one can name Daniela Rasse's study of the iconography of the guillotine. The rapidity of the execution by the new machine was troubling precisely, Aras claims, because it eliminated the visibility of the dying process, condensing the procedure into an imperceptible instant passed before it was even present. Aras speaks of a blinding instantaneity, and one wonders whether in this sense the guillotine is an exception, or if it is just an extreme case revealing the more general eerie evasiveness of the instant of death. It is striking, incidentally, that Arras dedicated such a perceptive study to the visibility of the instant of death around 1800, but never pursued a similar study for the period of which he was in fact a distinguished specialist, the Italian Renaissance. Arras's discussion of this example and his insight on the visibility of death imply a more general question about the nature of time. 
the issue of the instant and its ungraspable essence. Two fundamental philosophical attempts to take issue with these questions are worth mentioning all too briefly. The already evoked St. Augustine, who famously wonders in his confessions, what remains of the present instant, given that the past and the future keep encroaching on it from both sides, that infinite regression leaves the instant infinitesimally short, its very existence thus put in doubt. Any instant is invisible like the fragment of a second in which the guillotine cuts a criminal's head, and worse still, it defies even abstract thought. And then Henri Bergson, who many centuries later proposed to substitute the notion of duration for that of the instant as the essence of time, claiming that the instant, that aporetic and dubious notion, is indeed the fruit of a misunderstanding of a spatial view imposed on time and foreign to it. This in turn raises challenging questions to the visual arts whose relation to duration is fraught and for whom spatiality is less of an anathema. Sorry. The Martin of St. Ursula is the pinnacle of my book project, Dying and Time, Painting and the Instant of Death in Early Modern Europe. Caravaggio, Caravaggio's artistic revolution is more generally, the, more generally the hinge on which the book's narrative turns. The Lombard painter didn't wait until his final days in 1610 to develop an unprecedented interest in capturing the elusive instant of death. Indeed, the initial trigger to the project, the artifact that drew my attention to the issue in the first place, was an earlier painting by Caravaggio that confronts most directly the instant of death. Judith and Holofernes, now at the Palazzo Barberini in Rome, shows us in a masterful way what that instant could look like and how it differs from both any moment of life before it and any second of lifelessness that succeeded it. Traces of consciousness are still there. One can even detect determined subjectivity, beautifully or chillingly shown in both eloquent hands of Holofernes and especially in his clenched fist, but this person is not alive anymore, not in any ordinary sense that we can give to the concept of life. It is the very fragment of a second in which the not yet joins the already, the slippery time particle that cannot, by definition, have any real duration. And yet, already here in 1598, it is made eternal on a painted surface. As you all know, one of the reasons for which the Lombard artist is often considered the harbinger, the harbinger of the Baroque is precisely because of his interest in hardly perceptible but momentous transitions, in instance, in instance in which some, something, something abruptly changes and in which what we see on the canvas is fleeting and ephemeral. In each of his two famous Roman chapels from around 1600, for example, he combined a scene of death, the martyrdom of St. Matthew at the Contarelli Chapel, the crucifixion of St. Peter at the Cerasi, with what is arguably a metaphysical transformation that is just as abrupt and fateful, a conversion, the calling of St. Matthew, the conversion of St. Paul. A few years later, now a fugitive in Sicily, Caravaggio supplemented the series with a third major metaphysical transition, uh, the one structurally analogous to passing away, but in the opposite direction, a resurrection, in this case of St. Lazarus, of course. As for the death of the Virgin, its title is a misnomer of sorts. This painting, in fact, represents the mother of Christ already absolutely statically and crudely dead. Rather than the moment of her passing away, the cadaveric appearance of Mary was, as is well known, the principal reason for which the painting had such a complicated reception. To be sure, none of these episodes is, uh, was by then new to Christian iconography, and Caravaggio's own conversion to the head-on treatment of such difficult themes was erratic. In fact, whereas the two conversion scenes do tackle the problem of representing the hardly, grasp hardly graspable fragment of a second when a pagan suddenly accepts the true religion and will never be the same again, the two martyr scenes, um, canvases, are more problematic. One of them avoids the specific, the specific complexity altogether. There is no doubt that Peter's, um, uh, that Peter's subjectivity is as yet completely awake to the point of grumpiness, which the circumstances wholly justify, his body active and alert. The martyrdom of St. Matthew is more ambiguous. It dramatizes the interstice between life and death, making it theatrical in the sense Michael Fried gave this word. 
The dying evangelist is exposed, almost literally opened up to the bystander's gaze, as well as to our own eyes. A debate persists as to the identity of the man actively raising Matthew's arm and examining the martyred saint, whether he is the assassin or on the contrary, a devout follower trying in vain to save the victim. Whatever the case may be, Matthew himself is precisely situated in the no man's land between being and non-being. His left arm already synecdochically beginning its descent towards the dark interior of the earth, presumably a baptismal font the evangelists use for new converts, but clearly a hint at Matthew's future tomb. His right arm flaccid and passive, firmly held by the soldier, but at the same time turning towards the divine celestial light and ready to receive the martyr's palm. Matthew's torso is made to turn around and unfold so that it is frontally displayed in the temporal in-betweenness the painting seeks to capture, his legs clearly still in the midst of that ongoing axial movement. It is as if Caravaggio chose not only to isolate the inf an infinitesimally brief paradoxical moment in time, as he did in other paintings, but to put the agent of this paradox, the artist's alter ego, even if Maurice's uh, facial features were given to another man on the left, to this man um, shown here. Um, so the alter ego as an artist is, is this man here. Um, and he puts, uh, Carvaggio puts him at the exact center, center of the composition and thus made the exposition of that strange reality the very subject of the work. The moment of death tangentially approach, approached is thus teasingly almost accessible to our eyes and yet forever evasive, ungraspable, impossible to situate. It is, is it, it is perhaps not a coincidence that Philippe Ariès, in his classical study of the history of death, L'Homme devant la mort, locates in the 17th century, the century inaugurated by Caravaggio's destabilizing enterprise, the transformation of death into an unambiguously punctual instant. It is the rise of faith in the duality of body and soul, claims Ariès, that gave death an unprecedented extreme brevity. But Caravaggio preceded that intellectual evolution, and in any case was not necessarily aware of changes in theological and philosophical doctrines. His thinking, sophisticated as any, was conceived and expressed in paint. To understand why Caravaggio's gesture is so groundbreaking, we have to examine his art in its own terms, as visual artifacts created in the context of other previous visual artifacts. It is necessary to remember how much creative energy was used before Caravaggio emerged precisely in order to avoid the head-on pictorial treatment of the instant of death. To go back to Judith and Holofernes, a very common iconographical subject met her long before Caravaggio, painters invariably chose to depict either the aftermath of the killing, Judith and her servant triumphantly holding the enemy general's head, now securely separated from his body. And if we have, here we have Mantegna and Tintoretto and Veronese and Cranach and Matisse. No, we don't have Mantegna, but we have the four others. Uh, or more rarely, the moment just before the attack, with Judith raising her weapon and preparing to strike, Holof Holofernes sleeping, but as yet, fully alive. Uh, here once again by Tintoretto and a later 17th century example by Jan de Brie. This is not insignificant. In fact, painting's complicated relationship with the instant in general, and with the instant of death in particular, goes beyond subject matter. While philosophy and theology could take up this issue, and I mentioned a few philosophers that did, and they are, of course, not the only thinkers to discuss the instant, or choose to ignore it, the visual arts, at least those with a figurative and narrative aspect, have had an extremely pressing reason to tackle it. Pinpointing the instant of death has always been for them just a specific case of a broader set of epistemological problems and of the latter's concrete technical incarnations that are at the heart of pictorial narrativity in general. Just as it is, as it is sorry, just as it, is, as it is difficult to single out the very short instant in which death occurs, it is almost impossible to dis distinguish any specific moment of an event as particularly significant. However, this distinguishing act, namely the representation of a distinct moment, is the quintessential challenge of pictorial narrativity. As art historian T.J. Clark, 
who will come back later, states in his book on Nicolas Poussin, to which uh, we we'll return, painting is an outrage to time. And of course, Gotthold Ephraim uh, Lessing's Laocoon, the founding text of modern aesthetics, is the seminal locus of the visual arts temporal unease. Thus, for painting, depicting the instant of death became a supreme test and often a frustrating, frustrating impossibility. This was perhaps particularly important in Italy, to tackle in Italy, the site that in the Renaissance saw an important effort of codification and normalization of narrative strategies in the visual arts, as is exemplified by the emphasis on historia in the writings of the period quintessential, period's quintessential art theorist, Leon Battista Alberti. So while it is imp an important section of my book project concerns the question of how Renaissance artists chose not to represent the, uh, the instant of death and how the next generation of so-called mannerist painters opted for an ambiguity and oscillation between life and death that seeks to occult the temporal dimension of dying altogether. I would like to skip these episodes and this, uh, today and discuss Caravaggio's legacy, the 17th century painters who all had a fraught yet fertile relationship with the Lombard tenebrist. Of this category of painters, the project includes chapters on important figures such as Artemister Gentileschi, Giuseppe de Ribera, and many others. But I will concentrate in the remaining time today on the two celebrated antagonists who ended up structuring around them the whole history of European painting between 1610 and the early 1700s, Peter Paul Rubens and Nicolas Poussin. Of the two, Rubens' connection to Caravaggio, Rubens' connection to Caravaggio seems at first sight to be the least problematic. The Flemish painter spent much of his first of the first decade of the 17th century in Italy and was in particular present in Rome in the years of Merisi's break, breakthrough as a transgressive superstar. Rubens famously copied work by Caravaggio and more generally combined some of the latter's innovations with Venetian colorito and his own Netherlandish heritage to create the, quintess the, quintess the quintessence of the Baroque that triumphed all over Europe in the following decades. However, similarly to the even more faithful Caravaggio's Ribera that we would perhaps address in the discussion if you want to, Rubens' contribution to the further development of our theme seems limited and timid, as he often refrained from following the audacious um, temporal zoom in on the instant of death invented by Caravaggio. Some exceptions do remain, but it seems that each time Rubens' obsession with physical force and explosive energy, in short, with vitality, with life, made him reluctant to investigate seriously the coming of death. Among such ambivalent quasi-exceptions, one could mention the version of the Massacre of the Innocents that you all know very well uh, here in Munich. Contrary to the earlier Toronto version, actually this is the earlier Toronto version, um, the, the uh, focused on pregnant moments just before the fatal one at the Alta Pinacotec, uh, one of the persecuted children is represented at the instant of being hit and presumably uh, dying. But this is a detail of a huge composition full of action and a multitude of other figures. Another possible exception, the martyrdom of St. Thomas, now in Prague, uh, where the martyr is attacked by two weapons simultaneously, but precisely the doubling of the act reduces its temporal specificity and poignancy and raises a doubt around the actual cause and process of disease. Also next door, the painting that the Alte Pinacotec calls the death of Seneca in English, but more precisely probably the Sterbende Seneca in German, and in which indeed the Stoic is perhaps dying, but as yet vigorously alive. And finally, the Marseille boar hunt, audaciously anticipating by two and a half centuries Gustave Courbet's groundbreaking La Lalie du Cerf, but of course not exactly depicting the specific subject matter of human death. But above all, the most spectacular act manqué in Rubens's career in terms of the avoidance of the instant of death is crowning one of his most spectacular achievements, the Marie de Medicis cycle uh, created for the Palais de Luxembourg, but now at the Louvre in Paris. 
in the centerpiece of that rich pictorial, pictorial eulogy, we expect to see the assassination of King Henry IV, which changed the trajectory of history, and in particular, the Queen's fate. The erudite Nicolas Claude Fabri de Perse Peresque in a 1622 letter to Rubens himself does in fact mention the painting as representing la mort du roi, the death of the king. But a quick glance on the work itself would suffice to realize that Rubens avoided the direct representation of the royal death and replaced it with an allegorical periphrasis. This is surprising because one would assume that Rubens had every reason to depict the instant of death here. The violent character of the murder could perfectly fit the concentration on a condensed fragment of time. The event was politically charged and thus could easily justify being explicitly shown. And the caus causality between the two events included in a single composition, uh, the king's death on the left and the wife's regency on the right would be reinforced by such a historically precise visual representation. Rubens chose otherwise. Within the cycle constantly, the cycle constantly oscillating between history and allegory, mimesis and fantasy, the central picture is no exception. <clears throat> But no, sorry, the death of Henry IV is represented not as a concrete historical fact, but as an apotheosis in the concept of the whole cycle celebrating, according to Marianne Cojano Leblanc and Evelyn Priou, the apotheosis of the queen. The king is not shown at the instant of his expiry, but already ascending into heaven, leaving aside the question of whether it is his physical ephemeral body defined in the celebrated concept studied by Ernest Kantorowicz of the king's two bodies, or his soul that is the subject of this upwards movement. The concrete cause of death is only hinted at by the snake, um, uh, sorry, by the snake encircling the royal leg, of course, signifying perfidy and, and, and uh, bad faith, but not even shown at the very instant of the biting. It is possible, especially if we contrast the loftiest of beings with the destiny of the beastly boar in Rubens's works, uh, that decorum prevented the Flemish painter from representing the king's death as a real life uh, event. Indeed, aside from some prints that did seek to depict assassinations of early modern kings shortly after the events, one had to wait until the 19th century and its plethora of historicist painters to find serious interest in depictions uh, of royal murders, including Henry IV here in Charles Gustave Housset, L'Assassinat d'Henri IV et l'Arrestation de Ravaillac from 1860. Without being able to elaborate now uh, on the fascinating question of the specific category of painted political death and its relation to instantaneity. An article on that subject is also forthcoming, but in French. It is important to mention that there seems to be indeed an issue with the depiction of royal disease with the, when the monarch in question is contemporary rather than biblical or mythological, and the absence of images is intentional. In 1598, the same year, incidentally or not, in which Caravaggio painted his first pictorial manifest on the instant of death, Judith and Furness, that we saw before, the lengthy, painful, and messy agony of Philip II of Spain not only attracted interest all over Europe and the colonized world, a mix of profound sorrow and schadenfreude, Freude, depending on political and confessional identities, but also satisfied that curiosity by being the object of numerous narrative accounts, including, according to Carlos M. N. Eire, many unpleasant and humiliating details. Philip's lengthy physical suffering was not hidden, including messy bodily fluids and terrible pain. On the contrary, they were recounted again and again in order to make the king a model, a model of virtuous, humble suffering when confronting the final chapter of life. We also learn that in all the eyewitness accounts of Philip's passing, the moment of death itself is somewhat anticlimactic, but that all the chroniclers want to make it clear that the transito, or crossing over from the world, this world to the next, is something that should be experienced while fully conscious. Of course, a paradox in itself, uh, like we saw with St. Ursula before. Philip wanted to know exactly what was happening and when it was happening, and the very moment of his death was inevitably both the decisive point of the narrative and the one in which it starts to wind down and become something else, a tale of mourning. <clears throat> 
this verbal profusion is surprising even to readers of uh, uh, living in our mass media times where celebrity deaths are discussed and narrated insatiably, but rarely with so much graphic detail. However, graphic is a misleading term here, as the other unexpected fact arising from Phillips and other early modern noble death is the huge gap between the sheer number and detail of these textual, textual accounts on the one hand, and the almost total absence of any corresponding images of royal death. If indeed the descriptions of the king's physical suffering are explained by the possibility they offer to identify with the king and to seek to imitate his patient behavior, the magnitude of his suffering and the merit of his patience, as it was said back then, it seems curious that this campaign was not accompanied by the most efficient models for emulation and the most reliable enhancers of empathy, visual, visual images. Rubens also seems to have, uh, not yet, seems to have preferred respecting the norms concerning royal expiry rather than developing further Caravaggio's investigation of the instantaneity of death. This might seem counter counterintuitive, but may be explained both by aesthetic reasons of artistic temperament that I hinted at before, and by the political context of the painter's great proximity to the Habsburgs. The opposite surprise awaits us when we turn now to the artists retrospectively considered in 17th century artistic circles, in France in particular, the nemesis of the Flemish master, the proverbial classicist counterweight to Rubens's Baroque, but also the quintessential anti-Caravaggio. A little more than a decade after Melissa's death on the way to the Eternal City, so in uh, this happened in 1610, Nicolas Poussin reached Rome where he would stay for most of his career. Famously, according to his biographer, Felibien, the French painter declared that Caravaggio était venu au monde pour détruire la peinture, came to this world in order to destroy painting. Louis Marin, in a book titled after this statement, Détruire la peinture, to destroy painting, seeks to explain what made these two artists so antagonistic and what in painting was so precious to Poussin and for him annihilated by his Italian colleague. It has to do principally with the relationship, principally with the relation of painting with words and texts. Poussin is not only the peintre philosophe par excellence, but also as Bernhard Stumpfhaus suggests, the quintessential painter poet. After all, another of the, his oft quoted sayings, this time well documented, is the instruction to his friend and patron, patron Chanteloup, to read the story and the picture, Lisez l'histoire et le tableau. While it is impossible here to sum up Marin's rich and dense book, one of his main arguments is that Poussin's art is a representation of the process of narrative, this, uh, uh, of narrative representation characteristic of history. His paintings are pieces of meta history. They are durationally legible like a narrative or historical text would be. The French, like the German and the Italian, uses the same word, histoire, for both. Caravaggio's works, on the contrary, are lacking in action, or rather is, are devoid uh, of, the of the sequences of human actions, which are the very essence since the Renaissance, the Renaissance of pictorial historia. Marin's principal examples are, lo and behold, sins of death. In Caravaggio's case, it is the head of Medusa, a particularly striking depiction of the moment of demise in which, just like Ursula, the Gorgon is represented both obviously conscious of her death and as is inevitable giving her standalone head already dead. In this painting, claims Marin, Caravaggio invents an instant de vision, an infinitesimally brief moment of vision that defies duration. As for Poussin, his painting uh, that interests Marin most in this book is also very directly related to death, but not to the actual event of it taking place. In the Louvre version of Et, Ar Et in Arcadia Ego, Ego, or the Arcadian Shepherd, uh, death is a thing of the past, suddenly recalled, narrated, its present alluded to in the mute exchange between the four figures, but nobody dies in the present time of the painting. For my part, I would like to take a closer look now at Poussin's first major history painting, according to the Minneapolis Museum of Art, where it is displayed. And uh, for Anthony Blunt, uh, 
It is Poussin's first fully mature work, whereas for Charles Dempsey, it was with it that Poussin first became Poussin. Once again, and maybe not coincidentally, it is also presents a narrative of death. In the death of Germanicus, commissioned by the Cardinal Francesco Barberini, and moreover, according to the catalog of the Barberini exhibition last year in Rome, one of the most significant artworks of Barberini on Rome, we see the young Roman general who, according to Tacitus's account, has just been poisoned by his jealous adoptive father, the Emperor Tiberius. On his deathbed, Germanicus asks his friends to avenge his murder and his wife to endure her sorrow bravely. While not exactly a royal death, it is a quasi-imperial one, occurring moreover at the Christly age of 33. But what specific moment of that heartbreaking scene did Poussin choose to represent? Scholars disagree. Blunt claims somewhat vaguely that the hero is seen here making his friends swear the oath and that his right hand is the focal point for the whole design. For Sebastian Schütze, who emphasizes the painting's amplific Amplificatio Christiana of the original Roman story, Germanicus has just finished his speech and seems to sink back in his bed. In his bed. Sorry, just discovered I had water here. Richard Verdi speaks of the moment before the final farewell, with two episodes still to come before the protagonist finally expires, the holding of his hand by one of his friends, followed by the hero's farewell to the family. In a preparatory drawing to the painting, indeed, uh, the soldier's leader already, or still, touches Germanicus's hand, in line with Tacitus's claim that after the speech of the dying man, the friends held his hand and pronounced the promise of revenge. In this case, it would be clear that Germanicus is still alive and conscious, as all, art, uh, as all the art historians quoted above imply without hesitation. But in the painting, that, that gesture has disappeared. The captain, instead of touching Germanicus's hand, raises his arm in oath or pointing the heavens, according to the Christian interpretation. For Dempsey, this is an example of joining together several events that occurred in different times. The crucial issue, he writes, as the members of the Académie Royale perfectly understood, entailed temporality in painting or the representation of a complex story developed over time in a medium that by its nature is limited to the representation of a single instant. This in turn was crucial, again, according to Dempsey, for the institution of easel painting as a genre, the establishment of a new mode of pictorial thinking, a mode very different from Caravaggio's, or was it? Alain Mero compares Poussin's painting with our previous example from Rubens and notes that the latter depicts King Henry, Henry IV and his queen Marie de Medicis as rising beyond the human condition thanks to destiny's favor, whereas Poussin's Germanicus on his deathbed suffers the blows of a hostile fate and reveals his virtue through suffering. A more direct confrontation could concern Rubens' design for the tapestry, The Death of Constantine, which was supposedly one of Poussin's sources of inspiration for G Germanicus, and which avoids the instant of death, just like the Louvre cycle. Indeed, Poussin has often refrained from the literal reduct reductio ad absurdum of trying to capture the precise instant of the moment of demise. His three depictions of potentially uh, or factually lethal snakes, for instance, uh, share that avoidance, and they share it also with uh, um, Rubens's snake supposedly killing um, King Henry IV. While the landscape of a man, with a man pursued by a snake in Montreal and the Louvre, Orpheus, and Eurydice uh, represent a possible attack still in undeterminate future, indeterminate future, in the famous London landscape with a man killed by a snake, uh, the deed is done, the victim dead already, raising the very different issue of reactions to this sight of horror. But precisely, Poussin's usual and understandable prudence make Germanicus even more surprising, complex, and risky. It seems to me that here, in spite of all the narrative material that could structure a rich representation of lengthy agony for a textually minded painter like Poussin, and contrary to what most scholars claim, the French artist 
chose to show us that what we see is the liminal fragment of time in which the Roman general left this mortal coil. A few details subtly convey this artistic choice. First, Germanicus himself, his head in its color, in its position, and especially in the chilling vacuity of the eyes is the head of a lifeless man. The pointing finger, uh, on the other hand, literally, signifies volition and intention intentionality, but might just as well be the trace, the empty carcass, as it were, of a gesture made just before death mummified it forever. It is not the ambiguity of mannerist painters were especially fond of, a person seeming simultaneously both dead or alive as, and alive as analyzed by Frank Ferenbach's recent, recent quasi vivo Lebendigkeit in der Italienischen Kunst der früher Neuzeit. What we see here, as in Caravaggio, is the cohabitations of signs of life and death, not statically and durationally, but because what is represented is the temporal cast between these two states. Then there are the witnesses. Um, yeah, so this was to remind you how Caravaggio does it. Then there are the witnesses, depicting witnessing and reactions to a narrative seen as a common way, especially for Poussin, of signifying temporal concision, making it clear that something happens right now in the present tense of the, of the picture. While these participants, spectators, could be reacting to something said or to the dramatic situation in general, I believe some are clearly shown in the exact moment when the recognition of the fatal instant dawns on them. And thus, in 1627, Poussin writes a new chapter in the tortuous history of the painterly representation of the instant of death. He will go on to propose more variation on this theme later in his career, but to use Jacques Tullier's terms, he will more often give up la vérité de la représentation, impliquant, impliquant l'instantané, so the truth of representation implying the, inst the instant, in order to conserve l'expression de passion qui demande la durée, the expression of the passions that uh, de uh, demands uh, duration. Perhaps only once will he get as close to the Caravagist moment of the turn of the century than in his, uh, as, as in his otherwise very uncaravage and sorry, as in this otherwise very uncaravagesque work. A quarter of a century later, then in 1653, Poussin paints another death scene. A death scene. In many ways, it is quite the opposite of the Germanicus, and it is much less studied than the, studied than the earlier work. Christian scriptural iconography is substituted for Roman history. Vice replaces virtue. Genders are inversed, and the interior scenes becomes a sumptuous exterior perspective. It is this latter intriguing element that will constitute the starting point of my analysis of the death of Safira, a painting that one could also title Death and Depth. But first a reminder on the biblical of the biblical narrative recounted in the Acts of the Apostles, and which is not very well known, so you will be excused of not knowing at all what is going on here. It is a double tale with Safira's specific fate appearing in its latter part. And I quote, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Safira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it to the, at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a, such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. This is all what Peter says to Ananias. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what has happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, that's very precise, three hours later, his wife came in. So we really have a theater show here. The wife, the, the man, the dead man is taken out. The wife comes into the, on the stage. Um, not knowing what has happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. 
Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died at Peter's feet and died. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside your husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So of course, what we see here is the basically the, the sentence that said, at, um, at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. This is what we see here. The proximity between Poussin's painting and Raphael's celebrated cartoon representing the death of Ananias is undeniable. And the later work is considered by uh, Troy Thomas, for instance, a tribute to Sanzio's disegno, although many scholars ignore the link. Curiously, Conrad Oberhuber, in his detailed article on Poussin Raphael, for example, does not even mention La Mort de Saphir, uh, the death of Saphira, even though he amply discusses the designs for the tapestry series as a model for the French painter. However, not only are the two scenes part of the same narrative and Safira's fate inseparable from her husband's, but the compositions, in spite of the different media, are unmistakably related. I think this is unmistakable. Um, to use Stephen, uh, Stefan Zierholz's terms in an excellent analysis of, among other things, the temporal aspect of artworks, although his words apply to another pair of pictures, Raphael's Transfiguration and Poussin's Miracle of St. Francis Xavier, the French painter used Raphael's painting as a conceptual template, a typological figura. However, says Zierholz about the other pair of paintings, Poussin's work forms an antithesis to Raphael's. The positions of the two protagonists are almost identical. This is, I'm saying it about these paintings, albeit in the opposite directions, and thus they create, create a mirror effect more conceptual than immediately visual given the different scale and medium. But it is here that a crucial divergence makes Poussin's work reworking quite radical. Of all of Raphael's cartoons, this is the one in which depth is most limited, blocked by the somewhat arbitrary looking curtain behind Peter and the other disciples. The pictorial choice, this pictorial choice is perhaps not wholly arbitrary in fact, linear perspective and along with it three dimensional depth in painting or for that matter tapestry was invented in order to organize and complexify the historia. That is the series of human actions making up a narrative also known as life. It orders it in space, a sequence imaginatively taking place in time, allowing both simultaneity and sequential arrangements. Hubert Damisch analyzed perspective in a, as a tool of subject fashioning, and Daniel Arras, more specifically, closely connected the evolution of perspective to the iconographical theme of the Annunciation, the most life-affirming of all scriptural episodes a promise of eternal life. Another example from Raphael's, uh, sorry, so this is Raphael. Another example, uh, example from Raphael's oeuvre would be perhaps his most spectacular perspective, the Sposalizio. Once again, the orig origin myth of a new life created punctually and then eternally with behind it a multitude of seemingly random figures shown in the everyday action of city life. Sebastiano Serlio's famous set design for a tragic scene notwithstanding, death could not be anything else but a liminal moment of, of such a system of images thus constructed as it is a rupture in the temporal continuum of any narrative and the end of all action, even, even if it is sometimes the trigger for another sequence of actions. Raphael understood that very well and demonstrated this insight by reducing the pictorial depth in the scene of, scene of Ananias punish, Ananias's punishment to a mere theater stage-like podium, thus creating a mise-en-scene of time condensed stopped in its tracks. Poussin, without doubt, versed in the subtleties of Renaissance art and conscious of the deep-rooted associations of linear perspective, daringly end endeavor here to turn these schemas on their head, opting for a strong coalescence of death and depth, wherein, whereas his most vital scenes, his bacchanals, for example, are freeze-like and in the most literal scene, sense, superficial. He situates the fatal punishment of Safira in what is arguably the most spectacular linear perspective he has ever created, an urban panorama of breathtaking breadth. 
כריסטופר לואיטפולד פרומל, in a seminar article on Poussin architecture, identifies the models of the urban elements represented here, among them the pool of Bethsaida, referring to the following biblical tale of Peter's miraculous deeds of healing in Jerusalem. For Frommel, the panorama, the, the panorama offers a perspective of salvation, hinting at the heavenly, celestial Jerusalem. Other art historians have generally limited their interpretation of this structure to pointing the fact that perspective transforms Peter's ac uh, ac accusing gesture into a double sign. In the foreground, it is directed to Safira, um, with, um, as the narrative would demand, but if we carefully observe the pictorial surface without taking into account dimensions and distances, the pointing finger is ad adjacent to a secondary scene uh, interpreted as an exemplum of charity, which is the counterpart and the justification for the severity of Safira's punishment. She deserved death, not because Christianity is cruel and merciless, but on the contrary, because Christ teaches us generosity and charity. Behind and beyond the charitable exchange, however, a whole range of activities is shown. Uh, the, the life, sorry, you can see it here. The life um, of a whole society goes on while the death of a member of the community is inserted into the continuum of time. Like the Germanicus, Poussin emphasizes the instantaneity of death. The destrues are shorthand, shorthand, shorthand signs of immediate reaction, of surprise, and the open mouth of the woman holding Safira is a specific cipher of the punctual structure of the punctual structure of a death event. She might be emitting some vocal sound or just is just astonished, but she does it momentarily, transitorily. We should also remember that Safira doesn't die because she falls. On the contrary, she falls because she dies, meaning she is already dying when we see her in the pictures present. She literally drops dead. She was vertical a second ago, proud and conniving. She is now joining the horizontal order. In fact, the whole study could be developed on horizontality in Poussin. In the golden calf, uh, calf for instance, horizontal lines and gestures abound and hint at Aaron's suggested alternative to vertical monotheism. More generally, gestures parallel to the horizon are most resistant to the perspectival structure, or rather as here develop a rich um, dialectical relation with it. Death is, a, is relevant to the putative story, and one wonders, for instance, why Poussin was at pains to indicate the horizontally raised arm of the minuscule fig, one of the minuscule figures in the background about whose minimal humanity, just enough to be human at all in the painter's oeuvre, T.J. Clark has some fascinating ideas. And I mean, this person here that you can hardly see, I mean, it, of course, is much, much smaller uh, in the actual painting, but is clearly raising his arm horizontally. The incongruous play between, on the one hand, time stopping and space shrinking in the instantaneity of death, and on the other, the multi-layered speciality and temporality of literal, linear perspective, so extravagantly applied here, becomes, as is often the case in Poussin, a reflection on the art of, art of painting itself, on images and representation. Clark, T.J. Uh, Clark masterfully and carefully analyzed Poussin's pictorial thinking in action by looking at two other works of landscape rather than architecture, and with thus a different, looser kind of perspective is at work. In the Safira, the wonderful play on the water mirroring uh, what is above it, but never precisely synthesizing rather than slavishly imitating, reminding us that a painting, even when it is an enterprise of world building, is not the world itself, this feature Clark observes in the other world, uh, that Clark, Clark observes in other works, is enriched here by some wonderful, unique inventions. The pilaster under um, Peter's hand becomes the plinth of the charity scene, uh, which is in this way is doubling as a polychrome sculpture, sculpture disproportional and ostent ostentationally unreal. The pointing hand is also in proximity to yet another sophisticated moment of reflection, but not quite, 
supplemented by a, the strange assembly of geometrical shapes that Louis, for Louis Marin are traces, unused remains of the building activity that resulted in that strange city full of undestroyed, intact ruins says Marin, indifferent to history and the passage of time and mute witnesses to the extreme violence inhabiting the space between Peter and Sapphira, the judge and the sinner. Near the asymmetrically positioned vanishing point, but slightly off it, we see but cannot really see two images on a wall, huge though rendered tiny through distance. While Frommel identifies in them the Babylonian tapestries that adorned, according to Flavius Josephus, the second temple in Jerusalem, visually the subject matter or even their medium remains unclear. The stabilizing again any straightforward approach to my Mises might one might be tempted to adopt. The death of Safira is not only is not the only scene by Poussin depicting a female sinner in an urban setting. Christ and the Adulteress, exhibited just above it in the Louvre, uh, at the Louvre and sometimes considered its original pendant, uh, is similar in this sense. But its protagonist didn't die for her sins. Uh, on the contrary, the whole point of the story of Christ and the Adulteresses is that she deserved to be pardoned. And in accordance with the link we established between death and depth, uh, the architecture sur surrounding the scene here is much less spectacular. The spaced the space, sorry, the space far shallower. It does not imp implement the chita ideale structure type in the same lavish way the Safira does. Even the famous Pest d'Ashdod, the, the uh, plague of Ashdod, a scene of terrifying collective death is not as majest majestic in its setting. All things, all things considered, the death of Safira is unique. A masterful study of the elusive temporality of death, of its mysterious fleetness, of the conditions regulating it rep its representation within a narrative continuum, and the paradoxes such insertion necessarily entails. Even more than the Germanicus, it is an audacious foray into the risky realm of instantaneity and duration, rupture and continuity, and moreover, of pictorial storytelling, its marvels, obstacles, and discontents. More generally, however, Poussin reveals himself in, this paint, in these two paintings, and there are other less striking examples, to be the unlikely heir of his counter model Caravaggio. In a career phase spanning three decades, he reached a fragile balance between the demands of pictorial narrativity, that is the norms gradually crystallized from Alberti to Raphael and then further developed by the Caracci, assuring that the story is adequately told in a picture, and the Caravaggesque upheaval of, what, or in which, of which the fascinating obsession with the moment of death and with the instant recording um, on painted canvases was such an important aspect. Poussin thus paved the way to future further explorations of the instant of death in which the narrative fabric was once again undone with momentous consequences to the art of painting and even beyond. Thank you. <laughs>